We're continuing with our study of Mark's gospel. Has it been helpful? Is it helpful to get to know Jesus better by taking a gospel and just reading through it and, and spending time thinking about it? If there's something in particular out of this study and these sermon series that's been helpful to you, I would invite you to speak to either Pastor David or myself because we'd like, as we're getting closer into December and then we're going to re-pick it up sometime in the new year, to be able to share some things that people have found helpful. So we'll be sending out an email about that, but also if there's something that's been particularly touching to you in this study, please talk to either Pastor David or myself, or also Pastor Lori Eldridge, who is standing over here. Sometimes, as a retired pastor who's on our pastoral staff, we fail to mention Lori, and I always want to assure you that she's always available also for you to talk to and, and as we do our work together. Today, we are talking about the authority of Jesus, and because I don't want to be outdone by my son, I brought my own prop today. <laughs> I'm calling this message, What's in the Bag? And that, for the rest of the message, you can be thinking and guessing, what did Pastor Stan put in this bag? It all has to do, I will tell you, with the authority of Jesus. Because, as we said a few weeks ago when we were looking at one of the passages, to understand Jesus is to understand the hypostatic union. That means that Jesus is fully God and fully human. And that gives him authority. Remember, we said he has authority as a human being because he understands life among human beings, and so we listen to humans. Not many of us are looking for Martians to tell us how to live our lives. But his authority is also because he's God, fully God, and therefore he gets it right every time. It's also his ability to provide forgiveness of sins, not just for one person, but for the whole world. But here's the problem that we all face. There are so many authorities in our world. Amen? Amen. Everybody wants to be an authority. And in social media, the only thing it did is made everybody think they are an authority. And so the question becomes, which one do I trust? Well, I like to say that every biblical passage and every message has a theological foundation. The theological foundation for this message is the sovereignty of God. And I want us to hear that. Now, I know the word sovereign sometimes gets used improperly to refer to a bank, and that's not what sovereign means. I'm not sure exactly why they chose that name. Sovereign, a sovereign, is a supreme ruler or a monarch. God is the ultimate sovereign. God is not a democratic, or and I say democratic not as democratic party, but how we talk about democracy, God who gets elected. It's not that we all come together and whoever gets 50% of the vote plus one, they get to do God's will. It doesn't work that way. Amen? We have made a lot of mistakes in this world by thinking that that's how we determine God's will, and we do a lot of damage. God is sovereign. Jesus is sovereign. And as a supreme ruler, wants to be the ultimate ruler in our lives. So when we ask the question, who is Jesus? He is the ultimate authority. The death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior certainly bear witness to that. And we know that that shows why he has authority. In a few weeks, we're going to be talking about him coming into this world, being born of a virgin, the same thing. The way in which Jesus came into this world and lived a life without sin reminds us of that. In John's gospel, John starts it by reminding us again of this authority of this sovereign Jesus, this God human who's amongst us, who gave his life for us, as John begins his gospel, reminding us that Jesus is eternal, that's a mind-boggling idea. It was there from the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, is how John puts it. He is our Creator. All things came to being through Him, and of course, He became one of us. So now, as we talk about human authority, and we get confused by all these things that are out there trying to tell us what to believe and to trust them, we need to be reminded that Jesus is our ultimate authority, and we choose to put ourselves under his sovereign rule in our lives. And when we do it, our lives get better, amen? amen? But when I do it Stan's way, things don't go real well. 
That's why I don't want to be anybody's sovereign ruler. We testify to what the scriptures teach us. We don't look to have our own authority. So the big idea today is Jesus wants to be the ultimate authority in each of our lives. Do you hear that? That's his invitation to you you today. Trust him. Put him on the throne of your life. Let him take that rightful place and see how Jesus can do for your life what you can never do for yourself. One of the things I love about recovery is recovery begins with three ideas. I can't, God can, I'll let him. Done. It doesn't go beyond that. Those are biblical Christian ideas that made their way into 12-step communities Because even Alcoholics Anonymous began as a Bible study called the Oxford Movement, and they had six steps. It gets expanded to 12 steps, and it begins with that basic understanding that we choose to put ourselves under the authority of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But here's the thing. With so many authorities in this world acting worldly, right? That's what what you expect. You know, the world acts like the world. People act how they are. They do what they do. I think we say it, you know, the the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. Well, that's true with every human authority. They mess things up over and over again because human authority looks one way. Well, Jesus' authority is a humble authority. Get it? It's born out of humility, out of love and tenderness. Even the very act of God becoming human The Apostle Paul in Philippians talks about it. He uses the word kenosis. It's a unique word that's put together in the Greek language saying emptying oneself, literally giving up everything. That is a humble act that Jesus did coming into this world. As one of my Bible college professors said, it would be as if a human being became a grasshopper to save grasshoppers. Even more so, the humble act of Jesus becoming one of us. We see the same thing in Mark chapter 11. This humble Jesus authority. As we're told, the two disciples left as Jesus had commanded them to. And they found a young donkey standing in the street outside the front of the door. And as they were untying it, some bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying that colt? They said, Jesus told us to say, we're permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their garments on it, and he sat on it, and he rode it into town. Don't miss the importance of that story. We usually tell that story to begin Holy Week, because that's the Palm Sunday story of Jesus sitting on a donkey and riding into Jerusalem. It was the time of the Passover. Now, the Romans were in control, and the people were excited. Because they heard about Jesus. They heard the stories about this guy. They saw the multitudes that were following him. And everybody couldn't wait until this guy who had authority would finally get there. And so you can imagine the hoopla going around. You know, people start talking, and this Jesus is coming, and he's coming this week, and we're going to get to welcome him, and it's Passover week, and people could feel the excitement in the air, and they were gathering to go see him. And you know what they were expecting? Chariots. In was going to come Jesus, victorious Jesus, to finally kick out the Romans, and what does our Savior do? He shows up on a donkey. Hardly a power move, is it? I remember a few years ago, I learned about power ties. Anybody remember power ties? Power ties, the idea that you put on like a red bold tie and you walk into a meeting and everybody knows you have authority. I thought about Jesus. If Jesus showed up to a board meeting with everybody wearing a power tie, he'd probably come with a penguin tie. You know, it takes a little bit more confidence to go meet a senator or the president in a penguin tie than it does in a red power tie anyhow. But that's what Jesus did that day. He didn't come in some kind of victorious, I'm bigger and stronger than you, you better submit to me or else. 
he shows up in a donkey. Now there's absolutely biblical and theological reasons for all of that and prophecy from the Old Testament and what it all means about where we put our allegiance. But it's also important to understand that Jesus doesn't need to have a power tie or a chariot. His authority is offered to us, but it's never forced on us. He comes on a donkey. That's what he does in your life, too. He's not going to force himself on you. He's not going to walk into your home and say, you're not living your life the right way. You better listen to me or else. But he will come to you as a gentle, loving shepherd. And in the morning, you'll wake up and say, maybe I should go sit down and do my devotions before I do everything else that I do. Maybe it's time for me to offer a prayer or to read a scripture because I really don't seem to be getting it right myself. A number of years ago, I experienced the first of many tragedies in our family around my mom and dad's health and then eventually my older brother's health. The first one was my mom having a heart attack. And I was in seminary at the time, and I got a phone call early in the morning, and I was told that my mom had had a serious heart attack, and she was in ICU in a hospital in Fargo. They were able to get me on the phone and get her on the phone, and I was able to talk with her that morning. And that was a tough, tough thing. Little did I know it foreshadowed a whole lot of other things we are going to have to face in our life. Well, you have to understand that I was living in Lowell at the time, and I was going to school in South Hamilton, and taking that phone call and spending time with my mom completely got me off my schedule, and now I wasn't going to get to class on time. Ended the phone call, thought about it, and thought, I really just want to go to seminary. I just want to go in, and I just want to talk. Maybe I can share in one of the classes what's going on. I had it all worked out in my head. I'll go up to a professor and explain what's going on, and I love the professor. He'll have a prayer with me. So I drive, hopefully not too fast. It's hard to say, though. I might have sped. <laughs> and I finally show up. I park my car, and I walk in. And it was a class that was in the largest lecture hall, and so there's oh, about 100 students in the class. And I kind of walked into it by the library. I came in through the library and opened the back doors, and sort of walked in to sit down, feeling all the vulnerable stuff around what was going on, thinking I'm going to go talk to the professor afterwards and have a prayer. And when he saw me walk in, he goes, that's it. I have had it with you students thinking you can disrespect this class. What are you doing? I am telling you, if you come to this class, you show up on time, there are no excuses. Whoa, did I sit there thinking... I didn't talk to him that day. I did express what happened later. That's not Jesus' authority, folks. Amen. Hear that? That is not Jesus' authority. It is not shaming people and telling people they've done things wrong and pointing at them and pointing it out. Jesus comes to us with a penguin tie on, on a donkey, saying, folks, listen to me. There's a different way to live your life. You're loved and beloved and cared for. And if you were the only one who messed up, I would come into this world to give my life for you, for you personally to have a relationship with me. Jesus' authority is very different than worldly authority. It's a humble authority. But it's also authority for those who trust him. Again, because it's offered to us and we get to choose to put our lives under the care of our Savior, we walk through life and we see a lot of people who say, I don't care about your Jesus. And all we can do is testify to what's in our heart and what works for us and allow the Holy Spirit to work in people's lives. You and I don't convince anybody of anything. When we go into the community and we hand out a meal or or we help kids with a backpack, all we're doing is living out the way that Jesus lived. And if the opportunities come for us to share the faith, we absolutely do, and we help people understand the hope that lies within us. But we don't go around, and we're not told to go force our opinions on people or force anything on people, because that's not our Savior's way. The Holy Spirit is already working in people's lives. See, we forget that all the time. When you are talking with somebody and, and you're dealing with someone and you're thinking, how can they act like that? And how can they believe that? And how can they be that way? God's working in their life. 
God's bigger than you and me. The Holy Spirit is already leading people and, and guiding people and giving everyone an opportunity to put our life under his authority, but it is for us when we trust him. Which takes me to one of my good friends. I talked about my good friend, John Wesley. Let me tell you about another one of my good friends. His name is Martin Luther. He also died a few years ago, and he started the Protestant Reformation. He was in God, involved with the complicated question of authority. You see, he was a pastor and a teacher of a little college in Germany, and he became convinced by reading Scripture that faith alone gives us our relationship with Christ. The problem is that's not what the Roman government that was in charge at that time, nor what the church was saying. And so one of the greatest figures of the day was just an obscure pastor who took on the authority of the papacy and the entire Holy Roman Empire. You see, Luther's critique of power and authority and his view of social systems grew out of his conviction that God alone rules creation, that Jesus alone is the liberator. And all of these social systems that can be messed up, he knew that they couldn't liberate anyone from life and death and offer salvation. And so he knew who he trusted. And therefore, one day he shows up at Wittenberg, the church, and he takes a 95 thesis and he hammers it on the wall. And later he gets called into a, a council. It's called the Diet at Worms. And he thought they were going to kill him. That's what he believed. He thought he wasn't going to get out of there alive. However, he knew who the authority was in his life. He also had to address the fact that people critiqued him because they thought his reading of the Bible was too subjective and individualistic. What right did he have to read the Bible and believe that God was speaking to him? But he knew that God's word was scripture. It was true and it could be trusted. Just like John Wesley would say centuries later, if it says it in Scripture, it's going to get borne out in human experience. And therefore, Martin Luther looked at what was happening and said, here I stand. I have to stand on God's truth. I can't bow down to human authorities and think that they have power over me. So he nailed the 95 Thesis. He goes to the Diet of Worms. And lo and behold, God really was sovereign and Jesus really was the authority and the entire German nation follows him and a reformation is born and people start realizing that we all can put ourselves under the authority of Jesus. We can have that faith and it was reclaimed in Western civilization. Martin Luther trusted the authority of Jesus. That gave him his confidence. It wasn't forced on him. It wasn't that his mother said, you have to believe this. Or his wife said, honey, you got to do it my way. He trusted in the one who he knew was all-powerful. Jesus entered the temple, the scripture tells us. And he began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he stopped anyone from using the temple as a marketplace. And he said to them, listen, the scriptures declare that my temple shall be called the house of prayer for all nations. But you've turned it into a den of thieves. Then he went on and he said, have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. But you must really believe. Trust. Hear what he's saying? The authority comes when we trust. When we make that choice to say, I can't, God can, I'll let him. I'll do what Jesus says. I'll trust his word. I'll do it his way and quit trying to do it my way. Yes, Jesus says, you must believe, really believe, and it will happen. And have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe you've received it, it'll be yours. But, I love it when Jesus gives us a but. But. Ooh, sounded good, Jesus. I can go sin and do anything I want and live whatever I want. And hey, I can tell Faith Community Church to just pick up and move across the street. It's not what he said. But when you pray, 
First, forgive anyone of any grudge you're holding against them so that your Father in heaven can forgive your sins also. Wow. Jesus walks into the temple, and those who were there that day were using it for personal gain. They were selling Bibles. Problem is, the Bibles were being sold for 100 bucks, and people were told, you can't walk into this church unless you buy my $100 Bible. Why, I paid 10 cents for it, and I'm going to sell it to you for $100, and I'm going to get rich, but you're not allowed if you don't. And people are going, what's going on? That's not the Christian faith. Only he was doing it within the Jewish faith. Oh, you want to sacrifice a dove? You got to get the dove here, only you got to pay more for it than you would have made if you had had it last year, and people were getting rich off of a religion. And Jesus says, that is not trusting God. Selling religious stuff for personal gain is not what we're asked to do. Then he went on and said, listen, you can have a mountain-moving faith, but, but, if you want to move mountains, you got to learn to practice forgiveness. Amen. Whoa. I don't like that part. I like the moving mountains. I don't like the forgiveness. Amen? Come on, let's all be honest here. I like to move mountains, but I don't like to forgive people. Amen? Best sermon I ever preach. Forgive people. Somebody walks up and says, every time, do I have to forgive and forget? You know what my question is? Are you willing to forgive? You see, forgiveness is an act of trusting God. It's putting God in control rather than ourselves. The very act of forgiveness, of choosing to forgive, is to put ourselves under the authority of God rather than thinking that we have to do it ourselves. I know because we've all done it the other way. And so Jesus says, you want to know what's wrong? You want to know what's wrong in your faith? It's really simple. Have you received forgiveness from Jesus? Have you accepted what Jesus did for you in realizing that you can't earn your own salvation in your own way to God and you need to receive that forgiveness that Jesus offers? And then have you learned that because I've been forgiven, I can now forgive others? Because when we do that, now we're choosing to put ourselves under his authority. That gets me back to my bag. Guess what's in the bag? I know and you don't. Unless you tuned into last night's service, and if you do, don't tell anybody. <laughs> it's a record. Chicago. I love Chicago. I've collected records since I was a little kid. I was 13 years old. I started buying records. I have more records than any human being deserves to have. And when I was in college, I went from North Dakota all the way to Fort Wayne, Indiana to be a student at Fort Wayne Bible College. I had a beat-up old car, and I didn't care. And I didn't have the greatest clothes in the world, and I didn't care. Because you know what I had? I had my stereo, and I had my records. And from the time I was a little kid and started collecting records, I always had the best I could have. I had the best turntable. I weighted that baby to make sure that it only had two grams and didn't put any more weight on my albums. I carefully cleaned everything with a disc washer, and I never, to this day, it's a cardinal sin in my life to touch a vinyl record. You don't do that. You hold them like this, and you hold them like that, and you carefully put it on the turntable, and you make sure they sound the best they can. And I sat in my dorm room, and I was okay. You know the first thing I did when I became a Bible college student? I didn't know anybody. I pulled out a flyer, and I saw that there was a record sale. I went to the record sale and bought a Willie Nelson album. <laughs> Records mattered to me, and they still do, unfortunately. <laughs> One day, a guy walked into my dorm room and thought it was okay to borrow my records. You got it. Uh-oh. <laughs> this does not end well. And he took my records, a whole bunch of them, because he knew I was a nice guy, and he figured I wouldn't mind him listening to him. And he went and he started listening to him. And I discovered my records were gone, and I went over to his dorm room, and there they were, spread out all over the place, laying out. Now, this is just a 99-cent record from Savers. So that's my real Chicago album. It's at the house. I didn't even dare bring it over here. <laughs> but one of the albums he borrowed was Chicago 5. And I walked into his room, and they were sitting all over the place, and they were smudgy. 
and they were out of their dust jacket, and they hadn't been put in the right way. And then I looked at his turntable, and it had a penny on it. And I was like, oh my goodness, every one of my records is destroyed. And I didn't say anything. And finally, one day, he brought them back to me, and he said, hi, I want to return these records. I said, thank you very much. And I took them out, and I cleaned them, and I put it on, and you know what the first record sounded like? <laughs> and I was angry. I was not in a good place. And I kept that for a while. And so one day, God spoke to me and said, take those records and give them to him as a gift. And I took the whole stack of records, and I walked down the hall, and I said, you know, you borrowed these records. Did you like them? He said, I did. I said, I'd like to give them to you as a gift. He said, really? I said, yeah, I just, I'm going to give them to you as a gift. Oh, could I borrow some more records? Oh, actually, no, I'd prefer you not, but I really hope you enjoy these. <laughs> and I let it go. I let it go. You see, forgiveness is hard, and it takes work. But if we don't, it just gets in our head. It's a funny thing. I shouldn't say this. I said I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to. A while ago, that person texted me and said, I just found one of those records you gave me years ago. It still has your name on it. I said, I hope you're still enjoying it. <laughs> Jesus' authority is when we trust him. It's for those who trust him, who can learn to forgive because we give it to Jesus who can learn to say, I don't have to do everything my way. I can do it Jesus' way. And when we choose to put ourselves under that authority, we discover what real authority is. Because you know what? Jesus doesn't have a human authority. The Bible teaches his authority is from heaven. His authority is not because he's smarter than us. It's not because he got a better education than us. And it's not because he worked harder than us and he won an election. His authority comes from heaven. So as Jesus was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him. And they said to him, Jesus, by what authority do you do these things? Who gave you the authority to do this? Don't miss what happened. The Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the Supreme Judicial Council of Jerusalem. It had 71 members. These were the three groups that made up the Sanhedrin. The elders, the scribes, and the chief priests. These were Pharisees and, and people who worked at the temple, who took their power seriously. Today, it would be as if you walked into the Capitol, or let's say Jesus walked into the Capitol in Washington, D.C., and was welcomed by senators, members of the House of Representatives, and members of the Supreme Court, who put their finger in his chest and said, what authority do you have to do the things that you're doing? You see, Jesus' authority didn't come from them. He didn't need their approval, and he didn't need their vote, because he's God. And he doesn't need us to make him the authority in our life. He is the authority. We choose and have the privilege of serving him and allowing him to control and run our lives. Jesus had an answer. I love Jesus' answer. Did John's authority to baptize come from heaven or was it merely human? Just like Jesus, isn't it? You ask him a question that you think you got him caught, and he turns around and asks you a question back. You see, Jesus turned the question back on them. John the Baptist had been a very popular prophet, and he'd baptized a whole bunch of people down at the Jordan River, and now they were stuck because he was also the one who had baptized Jesus. So if they said, well, he's just merely a human being, they were going to have a problem with all the people who had given them authority. But on the other hand, if they said, well, his authority came from God, well, now you've, you answered the question yourself, because John gave me approval and said, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. And they said to him, we don't have an answer for you. And Jesus said, good. I don't need to give you an answer either. Because my authority is from heaven, it's not from you. It doesn't matter what your neighbor says about Jesus. It doesn't matter what your school says about Jesus. It doesn't matter what your boss and your company says about Jesus. It doesn't matter what anybody out there who wants to tell us that they are the power says about Jesus. If we choose to trust Jesus, he's the authority in our life, and we understand that his authority is a heavenly authority. It's not a human authority. Now let's look in our bag one last time. 
You wondered what point three is, aren't you? If you haven't, you should have been. Because I put more thought into the third thing than the other two. Because the question is, what on earth could I find that represented Jesus' authority? His authority coming from heaven. And you know what I came up with? Nothing. It's a heavenly authority. It's not a human authority. You got it? There's nothing that understands that or represents it. Jesus' authority comes from God. Humble Jesus invites you to trust him by starting by forgiving yourself and others. Let's work on that one, folks. Jesus' authority comes to us and we discover that his authority isn't like Washington, D.C. or cable news or Wall Street. All those things do is mess with our heads and get us wondering why I'm so confused and anxious and upset. But Jesus' authority comes from God, from heaven, God becoming one of us, sovereign Lord, the one we choose to put ourselves under. Humble Jesus, he is sovereign. So now, no matter what we face, we can trust him. No matter what you're going through, you can trust him. No matter what problem you have, quit trying to work it out for yourself and give it to Jesus. Try it his way for six months. I like to put it this way. Tithe to your church for six months. Put Jesus in control of your life. And if at the end of the six months your life doesn't get better, we'll write you a check back. Because we know that when we learn to do it Jesus' way, it makes a difference because he is the authority. But now the postscript. Remember that tree? We haven't talked about the tree. I told you a while ago, I control the time. Anybody can leave at any time. Come on. You want to leave? No, never mind. I have one last thing. Not me. The scripture had it. And the postscript is that fig tree. Jesus is walking into town one day. He's coming into Jerusalem. It's a week before he's going to give his life up. And there's a fig tree with no figs. The tree looked alive and healthy. Think about that. Jesus is standing across the street from him and goes, Ooh, look at that, disciples. That is one fine-looking fig tree. And he walks over, and the problem is it's not the time of figs, and it had no figs on it. And Jesus curses it. Check it out. It's the only time Jesus ever does something like that in the Gospels. And people have struggled with that. Why, what about the poor little fig tree? Well, Jesus cursed it because it says, you look all lush and great on the outside, but you're not producing figs. That's the same thing that happens to us, folks. That's how far too many people live their lives. As individuals or nations or whole groups of people, we make it look all great on the outside except for when we're wearing a T-shirt on Sunday morning. We dress up, we put on the best we can, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. And we smile, and we put on a good game face, all the while we're rotting on the inside. Amen? Amen. And far too often, that's how we live our lives. And Jesus says, don't live your life that way. Don't be like the fig tree. Don't be like the fig tree that people get excited and says, wow, I'm going to have a great snack today only to get there and have nothing on it. Because true authority comes from God. It isn't from the outside. It's not from a power tie. It's not from a chariot. It's not from other people voting for you or everybody else giving you approval. True authority comes when we put ourselves under the lordship of Jesus. We know who we trust and his authority is what we live by and now we can live with confidence every day of our life. And that's what Mark 11 teaches us. Our big idea for the day. Jesus wants to be the ultimate authority in your life. Hear me? He wants you to trust him and make him number one. What is the authority in your life? Who or what are you trusting? Are you trusting that you can figure it out? You can outwit somebody else? You can argue better than somebody else? We'd like to have members of our elder team come forward, and I'm going to invite them to come forward with a simple ask. If you need to put Jesus as the authority in your life, please come pray with one of us. Tom, if you could come forward. Dave, if you could stand up. Worship team, if you could come forward. If there's an area in your life that you're not submitting to the authority of God, You're not putting Christ in his rightful place. I invite you to come forward and have prayer. And let us stand together and sing our closing song.